Okay, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Mass uh, 1203. Hopefully, you guys are all doing well. Let's actually just uh, jump right into it because we're like in the middle of a topic. And uh, only going to get more fun from here. So let's uh, see what we've, we've been doing, what we've been up to. So last time we started talking about derivative rules and formulas. Uh, properties, things that will allow us to compute derivatives uh, a lot easier, a lot quicker, a lot more efficiently without always having to go back to the limit definition. It turns out that sometimes for certain special functions, uh, we know shortcuts to differentiating them. So that's essentially what we've been talking about. We learned uh, the constant factor property. We can factor constants in and out of derivatives, not a big deal. We also learned that derivatives distribute across sums. Uh, so if I have a some of functions that I want to differentiate, I just differentiate each part. Um, you can mix and match those. We cannot do this across uh, multiplication and division. Um, we saw rules for uh, differentiating exponential functions, in particular e to the x. We also saw something called uh, the chain rule. Um, and that was a rule that allowed us to differentiate composite functions. Did some examples there. Some examples there. We rewrote some of the old rules that we had using the chain rule, which is always nice to have a more generalized rule. Uh, did some more examples and we kind of ended there. We ended with uh, using the chain rule to derive the uh, derivative of the natural log and we did an example. So now we are going to continue on this journey uh, with some more important uh, rules. So we're going to talk about things like the power rule, the product rule, and the quotient rule. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Then we're going to do a lot of examples. I don't think there's anything else I want to mention yet. OK, so uh, let's actually do that. Um, the power rule is the most important, well, not most important, the most commonly known rules so kids do calculus. Uh, you see them 10 years from now, they remember nothing. But do you remember anything from calculus? Uh, the power rule? <laughs> like, it's the one thing that they remember. Uh, because it's so, uh, it's not difficult. And it's, it's very simple. And it's like, it's the sufficiently complicated enough to make you feel like you're doing calculus without actually doing anything difficult. Um, but yeah, it's going to be the power rule. This is going to be the rule that uh, allows us to differentiate functions. Well, they're called power functions. Power functions. So that is, you want to find the derivative of something that looks like x to the nth power. Uh, where n is a constant. And again, remember for us, we're thinking of x as being greater than or equal to zero. Right? So um, usually greater than zero, but you would deal with the zero separately. Okay, so we want to learn how to differentiate things like that. So like uh, x squared, x cubed, x to the 17, x to the pi, x to the 3.9, right? Things of that sort. Um, very important kind of function, and we want to know how to differentiate it. So how do we differentiate it? Well, uh, let's look at a motivating example. So uh, let's look at the derivative of, say, x cubed. Right now, you might say, well, why can't we just do it the way that we've been doing it and just kind of figure things out as we go? Um, well, if I wanted to differentiate x cubed, I know by definition that would be this limit as h over zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Right. And so now this 
uh, expanding the cube, something that you can do, you can remember Pascal's triangle or whatever you want to do it, binomial theorem, but you would get like x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed. And here, your x cubes would cancel. Uh, you would have a common h. You have 3x squared plus 3x h plus h squared. And now you let h go to zero, you get 3x squared. So you get that uh, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, right? Which uh, kind of tells you that there's a pattern going here. You kind of see a pattern, right? When we wanted to differentiate x to the one, the answer was one. And by the way, you can imagine that there was an x to the zero sitting beside it. Um, when we wanted to differentiate x squared, the answer was two x to the one, right? Now, when we differentiate x cubed, the answer is 3x squared. So that kind of, uh, kind of tells you that there might be a pattern going here. So you might be guessing that the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1. And in fact, it is. However, proving that in general is not something to scoff at. One, um, if your n starts getting large, uh, this is a problem. Um, Proving this in general is hard, even when your n is a whole number. Um, so like imagine something like the derivative of x to the 100, right? Right now, even though I could build a Pascal's triangle to figure out what that would expand as when I put x plus h all to 100, I wouldn't want to. Right? I have better things to do in my time. Uh, time is money, time is precious, can't get it back, all that good stuff. Um, so we wanted some way to do this, um, much less, you know, something like, much less uh, things like, you know, the derivative of x to the pi, like how do you even expand that? What does that even mean? Like, or, or the derivative of x to the radical 17. Okay, like I don't know what that is uh, or, you know, so, so let's actually see, get a formula. So now, obviously, <laughs> so, so trigger word these days, okay, um, the power, is the issue here. If n is large or non-integer, uh, the derivative of x to the n is difficult to deal with. So the idea is in figuring this out, what we want to do is we want to take the power out of play. We want to not have to worry about the power. Um, so let's figure this guy out. And here's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna set y equals x to the n we want to find y prime. Okay. Now, obviously, the n is the issue for me. So the power is the issue. How do I escape this issue? How can I get into a position where I don't really have to worry about the power anymore? What do you guys think? Give me a strategy, something that I could think about. Like if, if I realized that that power is an issue, like I wouldn't want to do what I did if that n was a thousand or if that n was radical of pi or something. 
right? So having X to a power, that power itself is being an issue. I'd rather not have it. What, what can we do? Radical. So if, if I have, if I have an X to the N, you want to put in a radical? That makes it easier. Like, like if, so if I have an X to the 1000 and I'm like, ah, that power is complicated. I want to do something else. Throwing in a radical, I mean, you could get like X to the 500, but I mean, and that's not even the original problem you cared about in the first place. So, uh, no. Turn it into Other ideas? log. Logs. So this is what I want to get at. So now, remember, there were, since algebra class, there are a bunch of things that I think you guys intuitively now know are things you can use to counteract other things, things that are the inverse of other things. So for example, you know that if you have an equation and something is being added to x, like x plus 5 equals 7, and you want to solve for x, the thing that's adding to it, you want to get rid of it. You want to isolate the x. And so you just know that, well, subtraction is the opposite of the addition, right? Or if you have x times something and you want to know what x is, you know that, oh, division is the opposite of multiplication. If I want to get rid of the addition operation, use the subtraction. If I want to get rid of the multiplication operation, use division and vice versa, right? So there are these opposites that you can use to tackle one thing versus the other. What I want to, you guys to remember, which I have mentioned, but because it's not something that is commonly done, students often forget this. I want you to remember what is the opposite of exponentiation, right? If there's a power or an exponent giving you trouble, the opposite operation is the logarithm. It is not a radical. The radical itself is a power, right? So um, you want to get rid of a power, the logarithm is what you want to do. Conversely, if you want to get rid of a logarithm, an exponential is what you want to do, right? These are the opposites, right? So it's like addition versus subtraction, multiplication versus uh, division, and then there's exponentiation versus logarithm. That's how I want you to think of them in your mind, right? You always want to know what tool is useful for the thing, the, the problem that I have at hand, right? So yeah, the power is the issue. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply logarithms. That's what I'm gonna do. So now what I do is log both sides. Now what that allows me to do is actually get the power down and write it as a multiple. Right? So this is by log rule. I want to say it was rule two. I think it was the second rule I gave you, but I don't remember. Um, so uh, it doesn't matter. You should just know the rule. So that now I don't have any powers anymore. And uh, I can now do that trick where I'm going to differentiate both sides. Now, uh, what is the derivative of ln y? derivative of L and Y, just to kind of jog our memory from last class. How would you differentiate L and Y? Y prime over Y. Y prime over Y, right? Derivative of L and of U is U prime over U. That's the formula. So this will be Y prime divided by Y. Um, derivative of N times L and X, what would that be? N, remember, is a constant. How do you differentiate n times ln x? How do you differentiate ln x? What's the derivative of ln x? 1 over x. It's 1 over x, correct. Oh, it's right, n, over. yeah. So it's so n over x. n over x. It's n times 1 over x, exactly, because we have the constant factor rule. The constant can factor off. You differentiate the function part. You put the constant back, right? So this is n. So this side would be n times 1 over x, or, I mean, of course, this is equal to n over x, right? So that's by the constant factor rule. So this part here is by uh, chain rule log derivative formula. 
This one here is just by the constant factor rule. Okay, now uh, remember what we want. We want to solve for y prime. So here y prime is just going to be n over x times y. But what is y? y is x to the n. So here it's n over x times x to the n. And I think that's, give me a sec. I think that was a delivery. I have to buzz them up. All right. So uh, yeah, now what you notice is going to happen. Well, we know the laws of exponents. So this part here is just, uh, you know, this is x to the n over x to the 1. So that's x to the n minus 1. So, so that is equal to n x to the n minus 1. And that is my y prime. So this means um, the derivative, well, almost. Okay. I think they left it at the door. I think it's fine. Uh, note, uh, this may be an issue. if x equals zero, because uh, potentially it could be a negative power, but we can deal with that case separately. You know, so if x equals zero, then if y equals x to the n, it is also going to be zero. So then the derivative of x to the n in that case is going to be the same as the derivative of zero, which we know is zero. Um, so we can know that, that in the event that x is zero, the answer is just going to be zero. Um, but for a positive x, this is going to be the answer. So ultimately, we've just learned that d dx of x to the n is n x to the n minus one. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called the power rule. Four derivatives. There's a power rule for integration, but normally when someone says the power rule, they're, they, they're thinking derivatives. Um, that's that. Um, very, very important uh, rule. Um, Note, we could go back and derive a bunch of our previous rules easily. Just to show you the power of the, the power of the power rule, uh, I'm going to actually rederive a bunch of formulas that we did. In, in pretty much less time than it took us to derive one of them. Um, and um, we're going to do that with the power rules. So for example, we knew that the derivative of a constant was zero. Notice that I could think of that as the derivative of a constant times x to the zero. And according to the power rule, that's going to be c times zero x to the minus one which is just zero. So you can prove that the derivative of a constant is zero. Which we already knew, but it's nice to know that it actually fits in with uh, what we know. What about the derivative of x? Well, now we know that there's, a, there's an invisible one here. So that's just going to be one x to the one minus one, or in other words, you know, one X to the zero, which is just one. So 
derivative of x is one. Again, some that we know. What about the derivative of x squared? Well, it's two x to the one, right? So we know that. Uh, what about the derivative of x cubed? Well, that's three x squared, we just derived that. Um, we also looked at the derivative of the square root of x, right? We knew that that was one over two radical x. We had to go through the limit definition, multiply and divide by the conjugate, uh, simplify stuff. But what you can also notice is that a radical is a power. I could have written this as a half. Apply the power rule. And you get your one over two radical x again. Right, easy peasy. Um, we derived the derivative of one over x. Notice that I could have written this as x to the minus one, and then apply the power rule. Bring the power down, subtract one from the power. Right. Last time we derived this, we had to multiply and divide by the LCD. We had to simplify. It's a factor out an h. It's together. Yeah, no, the, all of these we can we could have done with the power rule uh, very quickly, right? So the power rule can do a lot of things because a lot of times, sometimes you have something that's written where it's not obvious that it's a power, like radical X or one over X, but because you know your laws of exponents very well, because Javon told you to know them very well, you can realize that, oh, I can just rewrite this as a power and just apply the power rule, right? So there are a lot of things that uh, you can be given that might look strange, look crazy, but you can just rewrite it as a power and then it's not so strange after all. Um, and that can also give you other powers. So like a, a chain rule example. So now if I have something like uh, di differentiate uh, the cube root of seven minus x squared, then I realize, well, if I can write that radical as a power, I can apply the power rule with the chain rule. So I differentiate the outer function, which is like me differentiating x to the one third, that's going to be one third x to the minus two thirds, because I did the power rule, leave the inside intact, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. So you just knowing the power rule, you can look at something like the cube root of this weird thing, and it's not a big deal anymore. Um, so, I mean, that's nice. So, yeah, it's the power rule. And, and that, that's something we know now. So this needs to be memorized. So if x equals zero, we take the answer to be zero. If x is negative, we ignore that case because we're not dealing with the complex numbers. So for positive, so this works for x positive. Um, if x equals zero, the derivative is zero. Yeah, that's the power rule. Uh, now let's look at something else. Uh, another important rule. Um, which we will call, uh, oh wait, no, I, I think I, I have another example. Differentiate, it's an example where we combine some of the other rules, so I thought I'd mention it. So here is another example, just doing this on the fly. And uh, yeah, so first of all, you can notice that there are several rules that we could have here. Um, and this part you don't have to write, but you can just know in your head that this is what's going on. First of all, the derivative can be distributed. Cross sums, and we can factor the constants out. Okay, 
Um, and now notice that we can actually write everything here as, uh, as powers, as x to some power. So for example, this is already in a nice form, x to the seventh. However, the one over x, I could write this as x to the minus one. What is one over the cube root of x? How would I write that as a power? X to the minus one over three. Yeah, x to the minus one third. That's right. right. So you can know all this in your head is what's going on. I mean, would you write that on paper? Probably not. If I were writing this, my very next line would just be me rewriting stuff in terms of uh, powers, right? So I would write d dx of 3x to the 7 minus 4x to the minus 1 plus 5x to the minus 1 third. That would be the first thing I kind of write down. And I'm not going to show that I'm distributing the derivative. I'll just know I can do them one at a time. So for this guy, this guy, and this guy, I would just immediately know that I can do those separately. This is three times seven X to the six, minus four times minus one X to the minus two, plus five times minus a third X to the minus four thirds, right? And by the way, the trick to subtracting one is of course, writing one as something divided by itself. Right, so if I wanna know minus one third minus one, well, I just think of it as minus one third minus three over three, right? Make it the same denominator. So it's minus one minus three, which is minus four all over three. Um, so you can do that quickly in your head as well, just by thinking of the one as the denominator of the other guy over itself, right? So I, I can think of this, this part here to get here. I think of it as minus one over three minus one which I think of as minus one over three minus three over three. So it just, it's easy to see that it's minus four over three. So now, um, and even this line, you might not even write, you could immediately just realize that the three times the seven is gonna be 21. And that's gonna be the answer. Now, yeah, so that's the power rule. Uh, we proved it, uh, did a few examples, got a lot of mileage out of it because it's a really important rule. There are a lot of things you can rewrite as powers. Every time you see a radical, it's really a power. It's another concept that I always want you to have at the forefront of your mind um, that students tend to not have at the forefront of their mind. So like exponentials reverse logarithms, logarithms reverse exponentials, very common thing that is very useful to know that you should always be knowing and should always be thinking about, but not everyone does, as well as radicals are just powers, right? Almost every rule that you're gonna see is going to write it in terms of powers, but if you see a radical, you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. It's a power, rewrite it as a power, apply the rule. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about some other rules that are going to be important. product rule. Okay, now of course, we use this as the name suggests to differentiate products. So this is if I want to find what is the derivative of f of x times g of x. Right. Um, and also want you to note, note, if one of these functions R A is, is a constant, just use the constant factor rule, right? So you wouldn't think power product rule in that case, you just use constant factor rule, right? So we're really interested in the case where we have two functions and they're not constants. So like 
x cubed times ln x, right? Or uh, e to the x squared times the cube root of one plus x to the five or something like that, right? So we have two functions being multiplied and neither of them are constant, right? So how do you go about differentiating something like that? Um, well, derivatives distribute across some, so maybe they distribute across a product. No, because if that were true, I would have given you that rule. So remember, derivatives do not disappear across products. Uh, I can show you an example. Uh, we know that the derivative of x squared is 2x, right? This is something we know. That's actually true. That's the correct answer. We've proven that multiple ways now. <laughs> um, so uh, we know that that's the answer. However, what if we did the following? The derivative of x squared, let me think of that as, you know, x times x because it is. And then let me distribute bad it's not it's not it's not right to do this but i'm just going to show you what would happen if you were to do it what if i distributed the derivative on each of those x's what's going to happen now the derivative of x is one the derivative of the other x is one so i get the answer is one so then i would have what the derivative of x squared is one well that doesn't make any sense the slope of the line x the slope of the curve x squared is not one um, because that would mean it's a constant slope. It would have to be a straight line. It doesn't make any sense. So you different, distributing a derivative across a product does not work. Do not do it. A lot of students do it anyway, but don't do it. It's, it's wrong, like even in the simplest of cases, right? Um, there are very few cases in which that could work. And all of those cases are kind of silly. Like one of the functions is literally the number one, <laughs> then yeah, you can differentiate, you can distribute. But other than that, no. And even then, no. Like if the, one of the functions is one, then the derivative of one would be zero. You'd literally wipe out the function. Yeah, the, like it's a very special case in which this is going to be true. Okay, so you can't do this in general. So if I can't distribute the derivative, how do I find the derivative? That's what we're going to look at right now and we're going to derive it. Whenever we're in a situation that we don't know how to deal with, and it's very, very, very generic, like f of x, it could be anything. Is it an exponential? Is it a logarithm? Like, I don't know what it is. Um, so when we want to deal with a situation that's that vague, you go back to the definition, go back to your roots, go back to first principles, as it's called. Um, so, let's figure out the answer. Uh, I want to differentiate f of x times g of x. Of course, by the limit definition of the derivative, this is going to be f of x plus h, g of x plus h, minus f of x, g of x, all over h. Okay, what's that going to become? Well, we're going to pull a little trick here, which mathematicians like to do. Those of you who are um, fans of uh, completing the square will know this. Um, sometimes math people, they add and subtract something very convenient just to kind of rewrite things in a different form. That's what I'm going to do here. I am going to add and subtract f of x times g of x plus h. which isn't changing anything because I'm adding and subtracting something. So I'm essentially adding zero. And the idea now is that I can split this, uh, split this guy into two parts. Um, there's going to be a part with uh, f of x plus h, g of x plus h minus f of x of x plus h 
all over h plus f of x g of x plus h minus f of x g of x all over h. Now, of course, uh, here, uh, your g of x plus h is a common term in the first one. Uh, your f of x is actually a common term in the second one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to factor off the common terms off of each fraction. Um, for aesthetic reasons, I'm going to factor off the g of x plus h and put it on the right side. I'm going to factor off the common f of x, put it on the left side. Now we remember something important. Limits distribute across sums and products, right? So this limit here, I can distribute, distribute across all four of these. So now I end up with the following. I end up with the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h times the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h plus the limit as h approaches zero of f of x. Yeah, come on. Times the limit as h approaches zero of f uh, 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 of g of x plus h minus g of x all over h. So we have these guys here now to calculate. And it turns out we know what these guys are going to be as general terms. What is the first guy? That's literally the definition of f prime. Times what is the second guy? Well, h is approaching 0, so I'm just going to be left with g of x here. Plus the last guy. h is approaching 0, but f of x has no h's in it. It's not going to change. That's essentially the limit of a constant. And this guy, well, that's the definition of g prime. So now we've had the formula. That is how you differentiate a product. That is the derivative of f times g is f prime of g plus f times g prime. This is called the product rule. That's how we differentiate products. Um, here's a check. Let's do our check. If I wanted to differentiate x squared, and for some reason I made it more complicated than I had to, and wrote it as x times x, would applying the above rule work? Uh, so here, think of the first x as my f which means that my f prime is going to be one. Think of the second x as my g, which means g prime is also going to be one, and try to apply this rule. So this would be um, f prime times g plus f times g prime. So f prime is one times g, which is x, plus f, which is x, times g prime, which is one, I get x plus x, which is two x. Hey, that works, right? I mean, we know it works, we proved it just now, but I just want you to see that, hey, it works. Even if I rewrite something as a product, it's still gonna work, it's, it'll always give me the right answer. So now we know how to find the derivative of x squared like three or four ways at this point. Um, but yeah, that is the product rule. Um, now, Sometimes uh, we have things in a division. Uh, what about the derivative of something like f of x divided by g of x? Ooh, right? But it turns out uh, we can use the product rule with the chain rule here to figure this out. Oh, by, by the way, you don't have to know how to derive this. 
right? Just just know the rule. <laughs> just want you to see sometimes that things don't just fall out of thin air. So just know what's in the box. And of course, know how to apply it to a problem, but you don't need to know how to show where it comes from. Uh, we can use the product rule. With the chain rule here. So what I'm going to do is if I have the derivative of f of x divided by g of x, what I can do is just uh, write this as um, f of x times g of x to the minus one. Then I can apply, so this is just rewrite. Now I'm going to apply the product rule. Product rule says differentiate the first function, leave the second function alone, plus leave the first function, differentiate the second function. Now the second function, notice that it's an inside function. I have g of x that's inside the minus one power. So now we can use the chain rule and we're gonna differentiate around it it's differentiating a power function, right? So the power comes down, leave the inside intact, subtract one from the power. That's me applying the power rule to the overall function. But the chain rule dictates that I have to multiply that by the derivative of the inside. So we have that. Um, and so what we have here is me applying the chain rule. So now let's actually just do some uh, cleanup. Uh, so here I have f prime times g to the minus one minus f times g to the minus two times g prime. Um, or in other words, I here have f prime over g. Here I have f g prime over g squared. I can create a common denominator here by multiplying by g over g. And so now I have f prime g minus f g prime all over g squared. So this is just a cleanup. But that is now our rule. Uh, so the derivative of one function divided by another function is derivative of the top bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. That you need to know. It has a name, it's called the quotient rule. Um, quotient is, a quotient is just a division. Right? So you obviously want to use this to differentiate divisions, right? Um, yeah, so that's called the quotient rule. Tons of people have tons of different ways for use as a mnemonic to remember this rule. One, you could memorize the numerator in the same order as the power, the power rule, uh, but change the middle sign. Of course, the order will matter. So I would memorize the product rule such that you differentiate the first function before differentiating the second, and then the numerator would look the same way in the quotient rule, except the middle sign would change. Um, people have like uh, low D high minus high D low over low squared, or, you know, me, I, I literally say out the whole thing. I have the bottom tender, the top minus the top tender, the bottom over the bottom squared. However you might remember it, remember it. Um, I don't particularly care, just as long as you remember it. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, ba -ba -ba. examples, which you are going to try and we go through them next time. And in the interest of time, I think I did copy these down in another class at some point. Ah, there we go.
Oh, and I might as well mention that too. Oh, nice. All right. Lasso. Lasso. Sample to try for next time. So try these. Um, Okay, so lots of examples, and we'll go over them together, but it would be much more beneficial for you to try them your, on your own, right? So I'll leave them here in the notes. Um, I can even pause here if you guys want to take a screenshot right away. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. So these are the uh, 19 problems. Uh, quiz three is on that. It's on topics nine through 12, which is going up to doing all of this stuff. As And topic 13, which is implicit differentiation is a bonus. You have your first test on everything up to 12. I believe for you guys though, it's the 19th, not the 18th. But of course you should be uh, checking the syllabus. Um, and all homework up to section 3.4 is due next week. Um, so I think I said it to be due like the night before your test or something like that. But again, check, check the dates. Um, but yeah, so our test is going to go up to 3.4 where uh, bonus content will come from 3.5. So I remember that correctly. Um, so that's just a little bit of announcements there. In preparation for both of these, uh, you should try these guys, which we will go over. We'll go over them next time. And I think I think that's it for now. Okay. So uh, we will end there. Hopefully that was. Uh, Clear, you guys follow along, um, but uh, that's it for today. Um, so that's it. Uh, have fun with those. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy your weekend, and I will uh, see you guys in the next one.